Now, is everybody good and happy? All right, we're on. Uh, welcome back to Math 107. It's time for to get ready for test three. Uh, test three will cover 4.4 to 4.8, and which is your logarithmic functions, and you got to be good with logarithmic func uh, exponential functions to be good with logarithmic functions. So one of the advantages, although you may not see this, of having test two, test three start at 4.4 and test two ending at 4.3 is it gives you a double dose of exponential functions because that's one of the areas a lot of students are weaker at because most algebra courses in high school, those are usually the last topics you get to. So we give you a double dose of that in this section. Then we're going to jump in a little bit of trig and 6-1 to 6-3 and 8-1 is just solving a right triangle. Okay, so I've taken questions from all you guys, um, and we're going to start at 4.4 with the review, and specific questions from the textbook, and let me just mention what 4.4 is to get you back into the swing of it. Um, prior to 4.4, you studied the exponential function. Okay, remember you study the exponential function, and a is a number bigger than zero, a not equal to one, remember that? Because if it's negative and x is a real number, it's not going to be defined for every point because you could have a to be negative three, and it's not defined for every value of x, such as one half under the set of real numbers. Okay, so you define a to be greater than zero, and the reason it's not ever equal to one is you would just have that horizontal line there. Okay, remember your domain is x is all real numbers. And if a is bigger than one, what does your graph look like? If a is bigger than one, it's just one of your little curves that goes like this. This is a bigger than one. Remember, it went through the point 0, 1. Your range is y is greater than 0. What was your asymptote? y equal to 0. If your a is between, let's write like this, 0 is less than a, less than 1, which means you have something like 1 half to the x. If a is between 0 and 1, the example might be y equals 1 half raised to the x, which is really the same thing as 2 to the negative x, and we saw this later when we were looking at our decay functions, okay? 1 half to the x, you remember your graph looked like this, and it still went through 0, 1, except you had a decreasing function when we had that. You still had the same range, y is greater than 0, and the same asymptote y equal to zero. They're at, on WebAssign they ask for it in interval notation. Okay, so in interval notation it would be negative infinity to positive infinity. That just means x goes from negative infinity to positive. Okay, and did you have to do your range in interval notation? So that would be parentheses to infinity. Okay, thanks. Anything else? All right, but that was prior to um, section 4.4, which is where your test was starting, but remember we made a big deal about that this was one-to-one, uh, -one, therefore it has an inverse, and the inverse for that function we learned in 4.4, the inverse for y equals a to the x is what? What's the inverse function? Log base. Yeah, y log is equal to log to the base a of x. And you learned how to convert from exponential form to log form. And you'll recall that for an inverse function, the domain of the original function is the range of the inverse. I'm going to call this inverse function. Use the notation. So the range for the inverse function here is from the domain, right? And so what was that? Okay, remember the domain here was all real numbers. 
So the range for your inverse function is that y is all reals. The domain for your inverse function is the range of the original. The reason I'm saying this is because some of you keep asking me about the domains of your log function, so I'm trying to get there, is that x has to be greater than 0. Again, the point is that whatever you're taking the log of, this argument, that whole expression, the whole argument has to be greater than 0. Cannot take the log of a negative number, and that came from that inverse part. Everybody remembering all this? Okay, and because you did an inverse, you interchanged x and y, you also changed x and y for the asymptote. So your asymptote is x equal to 0. What's your basic graph of y equals log to the base a of x look like? a bigger than 1, like this, and it goes through the point 1, 0. Okay, so reflection across the line y equals x. And then once you got all that, you were just shifting around and having fun. All right, what is it, um, what is the form for the natural exponential function? What's the equation for the natural exponential? Natural, y equals e to the x. Natural exponential function, e is about what number? 2.72. What is the natural logarithmic function? y equals natural log of x. That's understood base e. And remember, did, make sure you keep hearing it. it's log of x, natural log of x. Ln by itself is meaningless. It's of. It's a function. The natural log evaluated at x, log of, just like when you did f of x, log of the argument. Okay? All right, that's base e. What was common log? base 10, and you write it as y equals log of x. That's understood base 10. Okay? Alrighty, so the questions that I have from section 4.4, we're on page 445. Page 445, we have some questions. 445. And the questions have to do with these last problems at the bottom of the page. And you're supposed to match up the graph with the picture, the equation with the picture. And I hope that what you're going to do is look at domains and ranges, and that's going to give you the hint of what it's going to look like. Y equals log to the base 3 of X. That is just your basic log to base a, what point is it going to go through? Zero. 1, 0. Asymptote is x equal to 0, correct? It's only defined for x being bigger than 0. So when you look down here, where do you see a log that goes through 1, 0, has an asymptote at x equal to 0? 71. All right, so that is your basic y equals log to the base 3 of x. Okay? Is that good? All right, now let's do some shifting and stuff of that basic one, and I'm just going to kind of jump around here. Let's go to E. How does the graph of uh, E differ from the graph of A using your transformations? You're just going to take that same graph and all the y values are going to go down one. So which graph down here is the same one as 71, but goes down one? It looks like 73 to me. It should go through the point, that should be the point one, negative one, because this was the point one, zero, and now that zero goes down one. Is that good? You see how that's working? So this is E. All right, let's take that same log to the base 3 of x and go over to f. How, using transformations, log to the base 3 of x minus 1, how does that relate to a? It's going to go to the right one. So we're going to pick up number 71 and move it to the right one. That means the asymptote is also going to go to the right one. Do you see that? 
68. So 68. And notice your key point here on your test, or the test for this group for sure, I'm asking you to identify that key point. So you're going to keep up with where that one zero goes when you do your sketching. So this key point now is two zero. Do you see how you're going to do this? And if you were going to look at part B, check out your domain here. Your domain is that minus x has to be greater than zero. And what happens when you multiply through by a negative uh, inequality? You change your sign. X is going to be less than zero when I look for the domain of this. So that's going to flip it on the other side. That is going to be your reflection across the y-axis, right? Because you've, you've changed your domain. So you got your same graph as number uh, 71, except now it's flipped across the y-axis. Which one is that going to be? 67. Okay, does that get you going again on these? So work with your basic one and do your shifts around. Okay? Keep up with your key point and because I know for you guys on your test you're going to be keeping up with your key point to tell me where you've ended up with it. Where does your one zero end up? Okay? Is that good? Anybody else question on that? Check out your domains. Okay, the next question was 446 number 113. 113, 113. Okay, page 446, number 113. All right, it's y equals 2 to the x plus 3. All right, what basic function does this look like? What basic function are you going to be shifting around? It is an exponential. Your basic function, uh -oh. y, y equals 2 to the x. So let's just make a few little points here. Okay, y equals 2 to the x. I'm just going to graph it first. It goes through 0, 1, negative 1, a half, 1, 2. Just plotting some points get up with that. Okay, so that's 1, 2, 0, 1, negative 1, a half. Okay, that's that basic graph. All right, now let's go to the questions. Domain range and asymptote. All right, I want to go ahead and graph this. What am I going to do for this graph? Go left 3, right? That's a horizontal shift to the left of 3. So I'm just going to go over here 3. So all the x values are going to be moved to the left 3. So now I have the point negative 4, 1 half. I have this point's going to come over 3 this way. Um, so that will be negative 3, 1. And this will go over 3 this way, so I'll have negative 2, 2. I'm just subtracting 3 from the x values. And I got those. Okay, so the graph's going to go like this. Okay, so here's the graph of y equals the x plus 3. Okay, let's get the domain for this. Can you raise 2 to any power? What's your domain, everybody? You can just look on your graph. Are all the x values covered? X is all real numbers. What's the range for this function? Y is greater than 0. What is the asymptote for this function? Y equal to 0. Okay, that takes part care of part A. The real part they're trying to get to, because that was on your last test, is um, Finding the inverse function. Okay, so for part B, what's my first step in finding the inverse function? Switch your x and y. x equals 2 to the y plus 3. And now we need to solve for y. And this is in what kind of equation? Exponential. And if I need to get up in the exponent, what am I going to do? 
go to log. Okay, we can either take the log of both sides or we can use our little definition to convert. Let's just use our definition. So that's going to be log to base 2 of x equals y plus 3. y equals negative 3 plus log to the base 2 of x. And this is our inverse function. We'll use proper notation. Okay, that probably needs to go in the trash can. Okay, are we good? You can feel pretty sure. I know for sure you guys are going to have to do it, and it's rare that I don't ask this on a test finding an inverse function. Okay, all right. Now, how do we um, know how? How do we know what the domain for this inverse function is easily? The range of the original. So x is greater than zero. What is the range of my inverse function? Y is all real numbers. What is my asymptote? X equal to zero. Okay, X equal to zero is the um, y-axis. Okay, and what we all we have to do if we're going to graph the inverse is interchange ordered pairs. So we have one negative three. That's the easiest thing to do. One negative three. Uh, one half negative four, and we have the point two negative two, and the graph looks like this. Okay, so this is a graph of y equals negative three plus log to the base two of x. Okay, if you get, if you keep up with your points, if you're going to graph the inverse, you just interchange your x and y, and life would be great. Or you could say it is the graph of y equals log to the base 2 of x, which you know would go right through the point um, 1, 0. And then negative 3 just means you're going to drop everything down 3 units. Okay, So you could graph y equals log to the base 2 of x, which is going to look like this, and then drop it 3 units. Okay, is that good, everybody? All right, I want to go a step further. I want to go a step further. I want to um, solve this for the x-intercept, just for practice. Solve y equals negative 3 plus log to the base 2 of x for the x-intercept. Okay. Your book did not give you enough drill and practice on this, in my opinion. All right, if I'm looking for the x-intercept, what do I do, everybody? Let y equal 0. Okay, now we got to solve for x. What's the next step? Get the term with the x on the side by itself. So we get 3 equals log to the base 2 of x. And now what? Convert to exponential form. 2 cubed equals x. So x is equal to 8. So we know the x-intercept right away. All right. Um, you asked the question on 113. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. I jumped off that before I made sure that you were okay. Everybody good? All right. We're experts now in 4.4. So let's go to 4. Okay. Um, is it 118, I believe? Yeah, 118. Or 117. Okay. Well, your choice. Name it. 118. 118. Is that the web assigned question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, this is on page 447, 118, which is also apparently a web assigned question. Okay, the normal healing of wounds is modeled by this. A sub 0 represents the original area of the wound. And A equals the area of the wound after N days. Okay, so what's your A sub 0, everybody? Well, I mean in general. It is your size of your wound when you get first get hurt, your initial size. And then A 
is the size of your wound after n days. Now is your size of your wound going to decrease or increase? Decrease. decrease. And you know that because that little exponent there is negative, and that's your decay function. We're not talking about a wound decaying, we're talking about a wound shrinking in size. All right. So suppose that the wound initially covered an area of 100 square millimeters. Where's that 100 going to go? Okay, that's your little a sub zero, isn't it? So in our problem, we would have the size, the area of the wound after n days is equal to the initial size, 100 e to the negative 0.35 n. Okay, now if healing is taking place after how many days will the wound be one half its original size? So it's starting out at 100, so we're looking for when is it going to be half? What are you going to do? Okay, the future amount size would have to be 50, right? If it's half its original, if it's 100 to begin with, we're looking for n when a is 50. Does everybody got that? Yeah. All right. Let's just do this real fast. Tell me the first step. Uh, divide, 100. divide by 100 because I got to get the base with the exponent on the side by itself. So we get one half e to the negative 0.35 n. What's the next step? Take the natural log of both sides. Okay. So now we have the natural log of a half equals. And what is the natural log, which is log to the base e of e to the negative 0.35 n? Negative 0.35 n. Okay, what's my identity? Uh, log to the to base, base a, a of a raised to the n is n. Okay, and that's my identity. You're going to have to know all these identities. I know you guys on your test, it, it is, you're getting worked over on your identities and your properties. You don't have to name them, you've got to be able to apply them. Okay. All right. And so then n is just going to be punch away on your calculator. Okay. And the units are? n is? Days. All right. So that will give you days. All right. I'm not going to continue just in case the web assignment had 100 in it. My guess is they randomized that 100. I hope they did. So that you didn't have 100. You had some other number. Sometimes they, you, when they were under, I had a different exponent. Oh, you had a different exponent? Okay. All right, B. How long, so we're going to be looking for N again, before the wound is 10% of its original size? 10% of original. In math, how do you translate of? What? Multiply. Product. So this is going to be a times. 10% you write as a decimal, right? 10% of, and the original size is 100. So what's 10% of 100? 10, right? That's what I'm saying. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. 10. So 10% of the original size, 10% of the original size is um, 10. Yeah, you want it reduced to 10. So then you would have the f size is 10 when it originally was 100, e to the negative 0.35 n. And then you just solve the same way. Is that good? Everybody good? Does this seem easier when I do it? That's my job. Don't forget. Let you know you can do this. All right. I'm going to flip on now to 4.5. And what I wanted to point out to you again and again and again is that 4.5, you're just loaded with identities. On page 449, these are easy to verify if you just switch it into exponential form. So when you have these identities, just switch them to exponential form and life is great. Go to exponential form. And that would be easy to verify. 
Number one and two at the bottom, page 449, these are two identities that you just get worked over with a lot. A, a base A, raised to the log to that same base A of M. It's got to be A raised to the log to the base A. Both have to be A's. Raised to the M is M. This is all from the composition of an exponential function and its inverse, which is a log. That's all it's doing is forming compositions and log to the base a of a of r equals r. Okay, you'll be worked over on those on the test. Page 450, uh, these are in many books called laws of logarithms. They call them properties here. And this it really just has to do with where they're coming from, exp exponents. When you multiply with like bases, you end up adding exponents. When you divide with exponents of like bases, you subtract the exponents. When you have a power of a power with exponents, you multiply. So that sort of helps you get that. You had lots of good examples where you take an expression of log and write it in its simplest logarithmic terms. For this particular class, the, pro the question says, write this expression in the simplest logarithmic terms. Remember, terms are separated by pluses or minuses, while factoring means you're writing things as a product. So when it says simplest terms, that means you've applied all the properties of logarithms to get there. Okay, on page 453, this was to remind you that you can always take the log of both sides in number six. And then number seven says, this is the common sense. If log to the base A of M is the same as log to the base A of N, clearly those arguments have to be equal. Bottom page 453, you had your formula for change of base in a log, mostly because your calculator only does natural logs and common logs. Alrighty, so the questions that I got from 4.5 is number 27. Let's look at number 27. Okay, I'm on page, this is 4.5, page 456, and the first one is number 27, and that is natural log of 8. And it says, suppose that I'm going to tell you that the natural log of 2 is equal to A, the natural log of 3 is equal to B. Use the properties of logs to write each logarithm in terms of A and B. Not a problem. You have natural log of 8. I need either a natural log of 2 or a natural log of 3. I need to rename this 8 so that I have an argument with a 2 or a 3. Which way are you going to rename it? 2 to the 3rd. Isn't 8 2 to the 3rd? All right. Now, the only thing I know is that the natural log of 2 is A. But don't you have a property of exponents that tells you you can do something special with this little 3 that's up here? What do you do with it? Here, yeah, your property that puts it right here in front. So this is equal to 3 natural log of 2. And now you're just going to make your substitution here. They're just trying to reinforce your properties. And so you get 3A. That was almost confusing because they were trying to force you to rely on your properties, learn to get your bases, and make your substitutions. Okay, you may not have loved that problem. Did you not love it? Not too much. All right, let's try number 29. 29 is the natural log of the fifth root of 6. It has the same instructions up here. How are you going to handle that fifth root? What's the exponent? The natural log of 6 raised to the 1 fifth. All right, let's go ahead and put that 1 fifth in front using the property that says we can. All right, now the problem is I don't know anything about 6, but I know something about the log of 2 and the log of 3. So do you have a suggestion for how I might rewrite number, the lit number 6? Right, so this is one fifth the natural log of two times three. Okay, and now my property says that when I'm taking the log of a product, I can rewrite that as 
natural log of 2 plus natural log of 3. And so we get 1 fifth times natural log of 2, they're calling A. Natural log of B, 3, they're calling B. And that's all they're trying to do. They're trying to force you to make things fit. So you're having a great time calling this a game. This is a game. Make it fit the rules. What were you going to say? Is that going to be on the test? I don't usually put these on a test. There, I mean, I can test that you know the rules by giving you expressions that you have to expand or whatever. But this is a, um, don't forget, let me write down. This is like a game. Like a game. Have fun. There you go. All right. Everybody good? All right. That was the only questions I had from 4.5. Let's go to 4.6. 4.6. We're going to solve some log equations. 4.6. We're solving logarithmic equations. And there was something that I told you you got to always be very, very careful to do when you were solving a log equation. Anybody remember? Always what? After you solve and you get an answer, what have you got to always do? Check for extraneous roots. Because by applying those properties, you may be introducing some answers that really don't work in the original equation. Remember, you can't take the log of a negative number or zero. Whatever you take the log of must be greater than zero. Okay, uh, if you have a log equation, most likely you're going to have to convert to exponents if x is part of your argument for your log. Just like if you have an exponential equation, exponential equation and the variables up in the exponent, you're going to have to go to log. All right, so 4.6 um, questions were 4.6, number 13, 4.6, number 13. 4.6, number 13, this is on page 461, and number 13 looks like this. Log x plus log x plus 15 equals 2. What's the understood base in number 13? 10. 10. That's a common log. When you don't see a base and you see a log, it's understood to be 10. Base 10. Common log. Common log being our number system is a base 10. All right. Before I can go to exponential form, what do I have to do here? I've got to solve for x. Parentheses x plus 15. You're so perfect. You're using the property, the log to the base a of mn equals log to the base a of m plus log to the base a of n. All right, so you're using, it's probably property 3 in your book. 10 of x times x plus 15 equals 2. Okay. All right. The problem is, is your x is the argument for the log. So log to the base 10 of your argument is equal to 2. I need to find some way to get rid of the log. What's everybody going to do? Convert to exponential form. I'm going to go ahead and multiply that out. x squared plus 15x equals what? 10 squared. x squared plus 15x equals 10 squared. All right, so x squared plus 15x minus 100 equals 0. Why did I bring this uh, 10 squared over to the left? It's a quadratic so that I can factor. Y'all both were giving me the same answer. I just wanted to get the word quadratic equation in there. Uh, is that going to factor for me where I get a 15? Probably. X and X. To get 100, I would need a 25. 20 and a 5. Yeah, that works. A plus 20 and a minus 5. Yeah. <coughs> okay. All right. If I couldn't factor it, everybody's going to go right into the quadratic formula. 
All right, so we get x equals negative 20 and x equals 5. And is everybody going to check this off and be happy? Yeah. All right. You always go back to the original. Anytime you're going to check anything, go back to the original. You cannot take the log of a negative number. So that one's going to disappear. If I put a 5 in, the rest are going to work. You can always punch away in your calculator because that's a uh, base 10. You could do the log of 5 plus the, net, uh, the common log of 20. And on your calculator, that better come out with a 2. Okay. The main thing you're looking for is that you're not trying to take the log of a negative number. Is that good, everybody? That was number 13. Let's see what number 15 looks like. Number 15 is pretty much the same. Let me ask what the question, the problem is here. Number 15. This is natural log. So what's the base? E. e. And so what's going to happen here is that you're probably just going to have to go into your quadratic formula to solve. You would have x squared plus 2x equals e to the fourth. And you're just going to have to approximate using your quadratic formula. I forgot who asked me this, so I'm looking at you. Oh, you ask about number 13. Okay. Anybody ask about number 15? Nobody did. Okay. Number 33. Next question was number 33. This is an exponential equation. Number 33. It's 5 times 2 to the 3x equals 8. Can I jump right on converting to log form? No, because it's not a 1 in front of the base with the exponent. Not a 1 there. What's the first step, everybody? Divide by 5. Divide by 5. Now I have an exponential equation. A base with an exponent equals 8 fifths. What's the next step? Take the log of both sides. Do you want to take the log of both sides or you want to go to a how do you want to do it? Your choice. LA. LN of both sides. Okay. Take the natural log of both sides. And how's that going to help you get this 3x out of the exponent? You can put the 3x up. Okay, just use that little property. I think it's about property 3, 4, 5. Property 5. That's 3x times the natural log of 2 is equal to the natural log of 8 fifths. 3x equals natural log 8 fifths over natural log of 2. I'm just going to keep going. Divide by 3, so you got natural log of 8 fifths, 3 times natural log of 2. One reason I kept going here is if you're not using a calculator on this part of the test, this is just an exact answer. You just quit right here. Okay, solving for x. You can always go back later and punch in if you're really wanting to know what x is. All right, so once you get to this step, then it's just solving an algebraic equation. Any questions on that? Everybody good? Okay, the next example was number 35. There was a question about, am I flipping too fast? 35. You have log to the base A of x minus 1 minus log to the base a of x plus 6 equals log to the base a of x minus 2 minus log to the base a of x plus 3. All right, you got logs all over the place. Do you know how to simplify the left side? How would you rewrite that? Log a of x minus 1 divided by x plus 6. X plus six. And then simplifying the right side, you have log to the base a of x minus 2 over x plus 3. What's your next step? Cross multiply. Well, you're using the property. It, it will come down to a cross multiply. But at the moment, the log to the base a of something is equal to log to the base a of something, which means the two arguments must be equal, right? So you have x minus 1 over x plus 6 equals x minus 2 over x plus 3 using that property. Therefore, 
the arguments must be equal. Now we're going to do what you said, multiply both sides by the common denominator. And you already know from looking up here that x cannot be equal to negative 6 because you couldn't take the log of it. And x cannot be equal to negative 3, so you're not like multiplying through by 0 because it wouldn't be part of the domain. No way are you multiplying by 0. So when you multiply both sides by the common denominator, you'll get x minus 1 times x plus 3 equals x plus 6, x minus 2. All right, and I see looking ahead that your x squares are going to cancel out, so it looks like you're just going to have a linear equation to solve. You always have to go back and carefully check. I wanted to get you started on the setup. Is that good? All right, we're off 35. Now we're going to go to section 4.7. 4.7 is money, money, money. 4.7. You had two formulas in 4.7. You had A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT. And you had A equals shampoo. All right. When are you going to use the shampoo formula? What will the problem have to say to you? Continuously. Compounded continuously. If it says compounded continuously, you can go directly to shampoo and get your problem done. All right, so this one is <coughs> compounded, you could say annually, you could say um, semi-annually, Quarterly, daily. monthly, daily. daily. That's about all I ever see. Compounded annually, semi annually, quarterly, monthly, daily. What'd you say? Pretty much anything except for continuous. Anything except for continuously, these are the tradition uh, annually, semi annually, quarterly, monthly, daily. Okay, so the question comes 4.7. Uh, number 26, 4.7, number 26. 4.7, number 26. All right. Number 26. This is page 470. What rate of interest compounded annually is required to double an investment in 10 years? We're looking for the rate compounded annually, and we want to double in 10 years. All righty, so let's break this apart. Compounded annually, which of those two formulas are you using? A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT, correct. So we're going to be looking for R right here. Compounded annually, what does that tell me N is equal to? One. one. Therefore, N is one. If it were compounded semi-annually, what's N? Two. 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 Quarterly? Four. 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 Monthly? Three. Twelve. Three. Daily? Three. 360 or 365, depending on if you're lending or you're... Always use it to your advantage. It's legal to use 360 or 365. All right, so in our case, the N is going to be 1. Okay, we want money to double in 10 years. Where am I going to put the 10? Where the T is. Where the T is, so I'll just put a right there. And if I want money to double, does it matter whether I'm talking about $1 going to $2, 5 cents going to 10, a million going to 2 million? It doesn't matter because you're still doubling the money. All right, this is where a lot of people out on the streets really are not smart. You go up to somebody and you say, can I borrow you a dollar? Tomorrow I get paid, I'll give you back two dollars. Well, one dollar to two dollars might not seem like a lot of money to you, but hey, you're getting a great return in interest in one day. You are a loan shark if you... Um, 
borrow a dollar and somebody makes you pay back two the next day. Of course, I borrowed some money from my daughter one morning and she wanted like $5 interest by the end of the day when I went to the bank. I had to explain to her she was being a loan shark to me. All right, so don't let the amount of money overshadow what kind of interest you're paying. You know, I mean, if you borrow a nickel and I charge you a dime in a few hours, I'm really doing you wrong. It doesn't matter five cents to ten. Anytime you double. All right, so it doesn't matter the amount. So you pick anything you want to, and you could actually use symbols if you wanted to, but most people like using numbers. So let's make it easy. Let's let P be one, so that future amount then would be two when you double. And you can see if you did a hundred to 200. By the time you divide, it's just going to still come out to be a 2, right? All right, so let's just do 2 equals 1 times 1 plus r to the 10th. So 2 equals 1 plus r raised to the 10th. Now, how am I going to get rid of this exponent with the 10 here? You take the root of 10 for 2. Okay, you can do this two ways. And we'll go with your way first. Your, root, your way was to raise both sides to the one-tenth power, which meant you're doing 2 to the one-tenth power equals 1 plus r. You're just applying your properties of exponents. You're taking the tenth root of both sides. So r then is going to be 2 to the point 0.1, which you can just punch away in your calculator and then subtract 1 from it. Okay? All right. Now, how else can you solve an exponential equation? You could try taking the log of both sides. Let's see where that's going to take us. I believe I'm about to send you in a way that's worse than I meant to. Yeah. I was hoping that it was going to be nicer, but it's not. So your way is absolutely the very best. You can come down and keep going. You would have natural log of 2 divided by 10 equals natural log of 1 plus r. Then, unfortunately, you're going to have to exponentiate both sides. You could take the regular log. Um, if you took common log, you can take common log and then raise both sides to the tenth. Okay. This, this is clearly the quickest way to do it. You can always, when you have an exponential, you're just going to have a bigger mess going this way. So your way was best, so I'm sorry I also went off on a tangent on that. Okay. All right, number 26. Um, whoever asked that, are you happy? Who asked that one? Okay, number uh, 32 was also asked. Let's see what number 32 says. 32, this is on top of page 471. How long does it take an investment to double in value if it's invested at 10% per annum compounded monthly? That just means compounded monthly. It's an annual rate. All right, so let me, let's put that up here. Double, how long, 10% compounded annually. Okay, if it says compounded annually, which formula are you going with? Oh, it's compounded monthly, sorry, compounded monthly. It ha it's an annual rate, that's called a nominal rate, but it happens to be compounded monthly. All right, which formula? A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT. Okay, go ahead. So you're saying it's compounded monthly, but it's the annual rate of 8%. So the 8% is the, um, spread out over 12 when, when you When you see a rate listed at the bank, that's called a nom, nominal rate, N-O-M-I-N-A-L. And that means a per year rate, but then it says compounded daily, compounded monthly, compounded what? You have to go in and look at the details. Okay. You always got to be careful when you're borrowing money or investing money that you just don't look at that number. What else does it mean? Because 10% compounded monthly gives you a better return than 10% compounded um, quarterly or semi-annually or annually because you're getting interest tacked on more often. All right, so we got to use this formula, and i got to go quickly on this. Okay, we're looking for how long, so it will be a T. Uh, we're doubling money. What are you going to put in here for A? Two. Two. We'll put one for P. 
the rate is 10%, rate is the name, R is the number you see named in the problem, N is number of months in a year. Does that get you going on this problem? Okay, we're going to have to stop because I'm running out of time. We'll pick up here at the beginning of the next tape. All right, go take a break. Have a great five minutes. Okay, we are back. We are now on lecture 19B, and we're really just picking up where we left off last time. We're on problem number 32, page 471. We are reviewing for test three that we want everybody doing well on. Okay, page 471, number 32. This is really trying to get you to look at the difference between compounded monthly and compounded continuously. And everybody's always interested in how long does it take your money to double. And usually that's until you find out it takes too long, so then you better go get another job. Okay, it takes a while for money to double. Uh, how long does it take? Okay, the first one, it was a 10% per annum. That just means that that's an annual rate, it's called a nominal, but it's gonna be compounded monthly. Interest is gonna be tacked on every, at the end of every month. All right, at the, beginning of the, at the end of the last tape, we said we want something to double. How long? 10% compounded monthly. The 10% is the nominal rate, the rates you see named in the problem. The end is the number of times in a year that it's compounded, which is monthly, there's 12. We're gonna be looking for T. Didn't matter if it was $1 to two, five cents to 10 cents. When you simplify this, it's gonna always come out to be two equals. All right, so we're at the point where we have two equals, and let's see what point 0 divided by 12 is. All right, we're rounding pretty early in the problem. I put a bar over the 3 because it's going to be 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 forever. All right, so what kind of equation is this, everybody? What's it called? Exponential equation. And the exponents, um, the unknown is up in the exponent. So what do you immediately know you're going to need to do to solve for T? Take the log of both sides. Okay, we want to take the log of both sides, which then allows that 12t to come around in front right by your property. So we have the natural log of 2 equals 12t times the log of 1.0083 with the 3 repeating. Now we're ready to do what you were about to tell me to do. Divide both sides by the log of 1.008 with the 3 repeating. And so T then will be 1 12th this. All right, let's just get an answer here so we'll be able to compare it to compounded continuously. Of course, on a test without a calculator, you'd have to stop right here. All right, let's see what that comes out to be. I'm going to have the natural log of 2 divided by the natural log of 1.008, and I'm going to put a ton of threes in there. And now I'm going to take that number and divide by 12, which is the same thing as multiply by 1 12th. So T is 6.96 what? Years. Years. Okay, so if you're earning 10% compounded monthly, it's going to take almost seven years to double your money. All right, what's the current interest rates at, the t at this particular time? These tapes will be around for a few years, and I really hope interest rates go up. But what's the interest rates on your little savings accounts these days? I have no idea. 2%? Yeah, about 2%. It's pretty awful. Actually, they've just gone up um, 
where you can find some threes and three and a halfs, but they've been in the really low amounts. That's the credit, union. credit union, I think, is in the threes, maybe. But if it takes seven years at 10%, you can imagine that if you were hungry and you were needing some money to double so you could go get a Big Mac or whatever, you'd be long dead by the time your money doubled enough to go get your hamburger. Do what? It is horrible. You just have to get a third job instead of two. All right, the other part of the problem says uh, double your money. This time it's going to be 10% compounded continuously. 10% compounded continuously. So what formula we're we using? Shampoo. Okay, pert shampoo. We're still looking for T, and T will still be in years. All right, and we can do the same thing again, pick our amount. It doesn't matter, so we'll double. The rate is 0.10 compounded continuously. So we get 2 equals E to the 0.10T. And we'll just take the natural log of both sides. This is why the little shampoo problem works so well, because you can quickly do it. Am I too fast for anybody? Everybody's good. So we have natural log of 2, and what is natural log of e to the point 0.10t? 0.10t. So t is natural log of 2 divided by 0.10. Natural log of 2 divided by 0.1, and we get... 6.93 years. And what did we get when we compounded monthly? Ooh. Okay, when we did monthly, it was 6.96 years, and when we compounded continuously, it was 6.93 years. The whole point of this problem was to say once you're compounding monthly, daily, it's pretty close to compounded continuously. And compounded continuously is going to be a quick and easy way to make some financial decisions because for one thing for sure is that your account's really not going to stay at 10% the whole time anyway. Interest rates go up and down. They change every what day of the week. What day does the Federal Reserve announce interest rate changes? Now you got me questioning myself. I think it's Tuesdays. Every Tuesdays they announce what the interest rates are for that week. So uh, unless it's some kind of strange situation, you're not guaranteed your 10% for that many years anyway. So these are just this is just a great little way to make some um, approximations and wise decisions about things. All right, are we good um, with 4.8, 4.7? I think I answered everything that I was asked ahead of time. Anybody questions? Okay, 4.8 says, well, let's talk about those little bacteria that grow forever. We have uninhibited growth. Remember, we think that they will never stop growing, which is not what life is, because there are things that overcrowd and die out, or things that decay. Um, you might get such a small trace of it that it's, you can barely trace it, but there's still a little bit there. Okay, 4.8. 4 4.8 on page 473, I was trying to explain to you that the book is just using different letters, but it still is your PE to the RT. As long as your R is positive, and if you look at the little figure 52, K greater than zero, as long as your R is positive, you got growth. Whenever that little R, or in this case the K, is negative, you have decay. Okay? Exponential decay. So if you want to memorize new formulas, you can, but the whole thing is just a good old shampoo problem. All right? Okay, we had a couple questions. Uh, we're on page 4.8. We're on page 482, and the first question came directly from number one. Didn't get very far in the exercise. Okay.
number one. Let's see how much of this we can do. Those are our little insects. And how do we know without it telling us that the number of insects are increasing? How do you look at that formula there and know that this would be growth without the problem telling you? The exponent is positive. So you've got an exponential growth there. All right, so it's growing at 2% is really what's happening here. All right, so P is the future amount. What's the initial number of insects that we have? 500. 500. The answer is question A. Determine the number of insects at t equal to zero days. If you didn't know that 500 was the initial, if you put t equal to zero, what is e to the zero equal to? One. One. Okay. What is the growth rate of the insect population? I just told us. What is it? 2%, 0 0.02. This um, that's called the growth rate. Also called a growth constant in your calculus books. All right. Graph the function using a graphing utility, but we're not going to graph it using a graphing utility. We're just going to make a sketch. So P of T equals 500 E to the point 0 02 T. All right, you can use a graphing calculator to see it. Um, this is T days. This is population. Okay? And we're not going back in time, so won't T have to be greater than or equal to zero? All right, and what do I put on, what point do I start with on the P axis here? Zero. 500 because that's the initial number of insects that I have. And because this is positive, you could set up a chart and put in T to be one, two, three, and put, you know, plot a bunch of points and get those values. But the main thing we are wanting you to see is that it just represents a growth curve. You don't need the like, exact values, right? Right, if you were asked to graph this on a test and you didn't have a calculator, the main thing all we're really asking you for is to know that it starts at 500 because that's positive it's just growing like this yep okay is that good so far all right and what is the population after 10 days that's the next part how do you figure out the population after 10 days put a 10 in for t and plug and chug away on your calculator again you have to use your calculator on this Okay, E. When will the insect population reach 800? What are you looking for when you want to know when? 10. You would say 800 equals 500e to the point 02t. Remember, you divide by 500, take the log of both sides, and go for it. Is everybody good? Tell me if you're not. Okay, F, one of our favorites now. When will it double? What are you going to put right here? A thousand, because you initially had 500. So when will this thing double? And what's going to happen when you divide by five? You just end up with a two over here, equals e to the point 02t. And then you'll know how long it'll be before. in days. Be sure you're watching your units in days. How many days before your insects double? All right, I quickly talked about how to work those. Is there a real specific question? Anybody? Okay, number nine. Number nine. This is page 483, number nine. Number nine says we have radioactive decay. So the half-life of radium is 1,690 years. I felt like we did this one in class. Wasn't that an in-class example? Go back in your notes. I'm 99% sure we've already done this problem. 1,690 years. If 10 grams are present now. I think we did do this. Excuse me? I think we did do this. I think we did too. How much will be present in 50 years? 
Let's just get it set up and then I'm going to invite you to go back when we did section 4.8. If it's a decay, do you want to go with the shampoo problem? Steel? Okay, so A equals P E to the RT. All right. Your half life, one half life, E is 1690 years. And you're starting out with 10 grams. So you already know you have 10 e to the RT. All right. Now, how are you going to use this piece of information that the half-life is 1,690 years? What happens at the end of its half-life? Half you have half the initial amount, correct? So if you started out with 10 grams, at the end of 1,690 years, you're going to have 5 grams. And that will be when 10 is, T is 1690. Now, look what happens when you divide by 10. Don't you get a 1 half equals E to the R times 1690? You get half. Remember doubling? We had a 2 over here when we divided. When you're doing a half-life, you're really saying, when do I have half the amount I started out with? It's going to always simplify down to a half. All right, so this is, this is kind of a valuable piece of information that helps you solve for R. You're going to take the natural log of both sides to solve for R. Okay, once you know R, this is what we're doing is we're building the equation. So once you know where, what R is, you just come back and put here. Okay? The only thing you knew initially was you started out with 10. You knew the half-life. That helped you solve for R. And then you would be ready to answer the question, how much will be present in 50 years? So once you got your equation built, you just go back and put 50 in for your T. Okay? All right, so this problem's got a lot of steps to it. You had to know your basic formula. You had to know where to put in your initial amount. You had to know how to use the piece of information about the half-life to come up with your R. And you need to keep a lot of decimal places there because my guess is it's going to be point zero 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 something. It's negative zero point zero 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 four one. Three zeros? Yes. And a four and a one? Mm -hmm. All right, so then you came back up here and you had A equals 10 e to the negative point zero 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 four one t I ran off the page. Okay, and so then once you've got your function built, then you just put a 10 in for T and go for it and you've got the rest of the problem. Is that good? All right, wind me back to whatever that videotape was where I went over it. Okay. All right. We are now experts in exponential and log functions, and then we went into the trig. Nobody in here had a question at all about converting from exponential to log. Exponential, excuse me. Converting from degree measure to radians, radians to degrees. Just remember the negative in front of the degrees means direction that you're moving in standard position. Um, be sure you practice how do you find the terminal side of the angle. Where is it located? Okay. All right, no questions on 6-1. 6-2 was your definition of your... 6-2 was just defining your sine being opposite over hypotenuse and cosine being adjacent over hypotenuse and all your little trig identities. We were only in acute angles for 6.2. Only with acute angles. What's an acute angle? 90. Yeah. 0 to 90. 0 to 90. Okay, and you were just solving some triangles that were little cute triangles. Okay, nobody gave me a question from 6.2, so I'm going to guess that we're okay there. Oh, uh, let me just ask you a question. What is the difference between these two expressions? 
sine square pi over 4 versus sine of pi over 4 squared. What's the difference? Would the answers be different? No, this is just notation. All right, this is traditional notation. This really means this, okay? So what is the sine of pi over 4, you guys remind me? Square root of 2 over 2. And then when I square that, I'm going to get 2 over 4 or a half, okay? All right, just want to make sure you got that notation straight. Okay, nobody asked me anything from 6-2. All right, 6-3. 6-3 was your special angles, your 30, 45, and 60. And also using your calculator to approximate the values of your trig functions for some acute angles and solving some right triangles. It was also in this section where you had to learn to find what is the angle. Even though that's not in this book, that is a requirement for the course that you know how to find what is the angle. What is the angle? Okay, 6.3, there was a number 66. Okay, don't forget you're memorizing these numbers. 66, number 66, where are you? Okay, I'm on page 633, and we're going to look at problem number 66. We're looking for the height of a building. We'll read the problem together here so you know it came out of the book, and then we'll try to figure it out. To measure the height of a building, two sightings are, taking, are taken a distance of 50 feet apart. If the first angle of elevation is 40 degrees and the second is 32, what's the height of the building? Okay, two sightings are taken a distance of 50 feet apart. The first angle of elevation is 40 degrees. The second angle of elevation is 32 degrees. What is the height of the building? Was this a web assigned question? I wasn't just sure how to set it up. Okay. All right. Here's the building. This is the building. Okay. Um, apparently, what somebody is going to do, two sightings are taken a distance of 50 feet apart. So I would say here's the first sighting, and the angle of elevation is 40 degrees. And then it sounded like to me they were going to go out uh, 50 more feet, and the angle of elevation now is 32 degrees. Okay, when I first read this, because I hadn't looked at it ahead of time, I thought there were two people on each side of the building. Yeah. The the right. Thing. That was my first thought, and then as I was sitting here thinking about it, it I'm thinking now that it says they did the first one, and that's an angle of 40 degrees to go out another 50 feet. I'm thinking it's the same person. So they started here, that was 40 degrees, they went out another 50 feet, and now the angle of elevation is 32 degrees. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is this... They're 50 feet apart. Basically, the two sides are 50 feet apart. That's the way I'm reading it. So then from the building to the angle of 40 is 50 feet, and then from 40 to 32 is 50 feet. No, 50 this, feet this distance right here is 50. Okay. This distance is 50. All right, let's go with it and see how we're going to do. All right, let's go with the green triangle. Uh, this is the building right here with the windows. All right, from the first triangle, what would you have? What trig function? Because this is what we want to know. The building, let's call this B for the height of the building. You got this angle, 
you're looking for the building and then this is unknown, what would you say? What trig function? <coughs> Opposite, adjacent, so you'd have the tangent of 40 degrees equals B over the question mark. All right, what would you say using the orange, big orange triangle now? You would say the tangent of 32 degrees is equal to B over question mark plus 50, right? Okay, now I've got to find a way to use these two equations together. What do you suggest? Solve for question mark at the first one, maybe. Okay, you want to solve for the question mark? Yeah. Um, I would have solved for B. Okay. Let me see. I'm trying. Let me think ahead on your question mark deal. Um, if you solve for question mark. Okay, I think, I'm sure you can do that. In my mind, I'm thinking if I solve for B, it's going to be easier and set the two Bs equal to each other and then go for question mark. Okay. All right. I'm not saying what you thought was wrong. I'm just seeing this quicker in my brain. All right, so B then is the question mark times tangent 40 degrees. And over here, B is equal to the question mark plus 50 times tangent 32 degrees. All right, the B's have to be the same because the B is the height of the building. So if this B is this and this B is this, these two things would have to be equal. Is that correct? Why don't you work it while I'm doing this to solve for question mark as opposed to B and see how your steps go and then I'll put it up on the screen. Because I'm not, think I don't, I think I yours could, is going to. I think B would be a lot faster because then you'd have to do all this stuff to get the question mark off the bottom in the first place. Right. Try your way. All right. So if the two Bs are equal, our question mark times tangent 40 degrees is equal to our question mark plus 50 times tangent 32 degrees. All right. So all we're going to do is punch away on our calculator. Let's make sure you're in the degree mode of your calculator mode. How do you get to your mode? There you go. We're in degrees. All right, so the tangent of 40 degrees is about 0.84. So we have question mark times 0.84 equals question mark plus 50. Tangent 32 degrees, that's about 0.62. All right, everybody okay with me so far? You might not have enjoyed your question marks. You could have called that an X if you want, if B is the height of the building. All right, so I'm just going to solve for the question mark here. Do you want me to change it to an X? Y'all don't ever have like my question marks. Okay, so 0.84X equals 0.62x plus, I'm just distributing, 50 times 0.62, and that's 31. So now I'm going to say 0.84 minus 0.62 to get the x's on the same side. So that's 0.22x equals 31. x is 31 divided by 0.22. And that comes out to be approximately 140.9. Okay, I haven't answered the question yet, though. The question is, how high is the building? But let me make sure we're okay with the X. Everybody good with me this far? All right, so now to find the height of the building, it really doesn't matter which one I substitute in. I'll just go with the easy one. Tangent of 40 degrees equals the height of the building over my unknown, which is 140.9. So it'd be 140.9 times tangent 40 degrees. One four, oops, 140.9 
times the tangent of 40 degrees. And the building is approximately 118.2, is this in feet? Mm -hmm. Feet. Okay. How'd it go solving for um, question mark or your unknown over there? It's not nice. It's not nice? I was trying to process in my brain. I didn't think it was going to be very nice. All right, let's go through this problem again. Um, I, I, when I first read these words, they threw me for a second, just like they threw you. So I just want you to know I understand that. Because I first thought that the building was in the middle. And you had somebody over here, and you had somebody over here. And the total distance What's between them was 50 feet. That's what I was well, that's what I was thinking, but then I thought, hmm, let me think about this again. I think this is probably the way it was set up. So I will agree that this is not totally clear. To measure the height of a building, two sightings are taken. And, and the other thing that made me think that it was probably this way is that, um, you know, I see these people out on the highway and they're taking measurements and then they go reposition their plate. There's and take a measurement. So I felt like it was probably just one person taking the measurements. All right, if I find out I'm wrong, I'll let you know. Um, so I'm thinking it would have been clear if they said one person first went out a certain distance and the angle of elevation was 40 degrees. That person then walked horizontally 50 feet more and the angle of elevation then was 32. And then we would have all been clear, especially me. But assuming that this is the way they meant by doing this, my first piece of information told me my first triangle was that the tangent of 40 is B over however far that person was. And then my second right triangle told me the tangent of 32 was the height of the building over the question mark plus 50. I visually saw right away that I could solve both of these equations for B. And both of those represented the height of the building. So that was why I set those two equations equal to each other and solved for x. Where x really is the distance the person was out the first time. And once I knew what that was, I would look for the easiest equation to go back and substitute in and get it. Okay, so I think the problem here was the reading and it was throwing me too. Okay, is everybody good on that? All right. The next part, you had just some drilling practice. It seemed like in um, section 8.1, solving right triangles. Did you ever get it, Aaron? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. Question was setting up your triangle. We're on page. 775 and 8.1 and we had questions number 18 and 20. All right, let's first draw the right triangle. I'm just copying out of the book. Just wanted you to see where this is coming from. They're giving you a picture of a right triangle. Notice opposite side B is angle beta. Opposite side A is little alpha and that's what we try to do on our test, although sometimes you have your test typed by people and you don't always get exactly what you think you're getting. But anyway, I don't type the test because I'm not good at it. All right, and so for problem number 18, we're going to go back and label the C, side C10, angle alpha 40 degrees, and we're going to find the other parts. Okay? And if you remember, I had said, we're doing number 18 first that if you'll always use what you're given, you'll make less mistakes. So this is 10. Angle alpha is 40 degrees. And we got to find all the other parts. So here is a A and a B and a beta. OK, well, beta is easy. What's beta going to be, everybody? No. These two angles have to add up to. Oh, you're doing it. Oh, you're doing the web assign. I'm sure web assign switched some numbers on you. Yeah, that's probably why. All right, if this is 40 degrees, what's this one going to be? 50 degrees, because those two angles are called what? Complementary. Complementary angles. Okay, if I want to find side 
A. You're going to say to yourself, I know this angle. I'm looking for the opposite side, and I know the hypotenuse. So I've got angle, opposite, hypotenuse, which trig function? Sine. So you'd say the sine of 40 degrees is A over 10. So A then is 10 times the sine of 40 degrees. And in this case, you just have to punch away on your calculator. Okay? All right. To find side B. Okay, you say to yourself, I've got this angle. I'm looking for this side. What? How's that side related to angle adjacent and I'm given the hypotenuse. So angle adjacent hypotenuse which trig function? Oh. What did I write? I meant side. Sorry, side B. So I would be looking for the cosine of 40 degrees equals B over 10. I meant side, not sine of B. I was looking for side B. Is that good everybody? So B then is 10 times cosine 40. Say the words angle adjacent hypotenuse. When you hear that, you know what definition to use. All right, any questions on 18? Let's go to 20. Number 20, let's draw the triangle again. In number 20, A is 2, B is 8, and you're going to be looking for C angle beta and angle alpha. All right. How are you going to find side C? Good old Pythagorean theorem. 2 squared plus 8 squared equals C squared. Okay. Be sure that you're solving for C, which means you're going to be taking the square root of 2 squared plus 8 squared. Okay, don't forget to do the square root. Robert, didn't you forget a square root on yours? Mm -hmm. Did you mark it in red? Yeah, I did. I'm glad you put 159. It should have been 13. Yeah, be sure you're doing your square root there. All right. If I want to find angle B, angle beta. Okay, I'm looking for angle beta. And let's just use what we have. I know the side opposite and I know the side adjacent. What trig function are you going to use? Tangent. The tangent of angle beta is 8 over 2. The tangent of angle beta is 4. What's the next thing your brain is doing? Shift it. Shift it? Oh, shift on your calculator? Okay. I'm looking for the angle, so everybody's thinking, what's it called, though? Inverse tangent. Okay, I'll be looking for inverse tangent. Beta is the inverse tangent of 4. Remember, your inverse trig function says, what is the angle? What is the angle? Okay, what about for angle alpha? How are you going to set that one up? Okay, inverse, you got tangent of alpha is equal to 2 over 8. The tangent of alpha is equal to one-fourth. So you're going to say, what's the angle? So you'll do inverse tangent of one-fourth. That will be equal to your alpha. Okay, inverse tangent. Your inverse trig function says, what is the angle? It also says some other things. I always want to clarify myself. But for this class, we're just interested in the acute angle it's going to give to me. Okay, there is more to the story about inverse trig functions than what you had. Yes? Um, but, uh, can't you just minus after you get the first answer to 90, to fit 90? Oh, uh, once you do inverse tangent, inverse tangent of 4, that's going to be um, 75.96 degrees. Mm -hmm. and, what, and you were just going to say, can you just subtract that from 90 to get the other? Yes, you can. What I was trying to force you to do was use only what was given to you because if by mis chance you make a mistake here then when you subtract from 90 for the other one then you've missed it also so it is usually 
best to use only what you're given, not what you've found out. But if you're sure you're right, go for it. And it's always a double check. So whatever answer you get here, those two together should add up to 90. So you can always check yourself. Anything else about your test? We do number 23. Same page? Yes. Number 23. Where is 23? Okay, 775, number 23. Did you get a drawing for that? Not yet. I don't, I don't understand quite how to set it up. Okay, if you have, this is number 23. Let's look at the words. 23. Where do you find the hypotenuse of a right triangle? The right angle. It's always the side opposite the right angle. So the hypotenuse, let's draw a right triangle. The hypotenuse is five inches. The hypotenuse of a right triangle is five inches. If one leg is two inches, one leg. So these parts are called the legs, and it just said one leg is two. So you, it's your choice. Which one you? That's what I was going to say. Could it be any one or? Yeah. Okay. So which one do you like? Um, Long or horizontal, vertical? The vertical. Vertical. Two. Okay. Find the degree measure of each angle. So if you wanted, if you want this angle. What trig function are you going to use? Uh, sine. sine of alpha equals 2 over 5. If you want this angle, what are you going to use? Cosine, Cosine beta equals 2 over 5. Okay? Yeah, it, it didn't matter really which leg it was because you're just finding the angles opposite. All right, another question for me? Okay, so the test is uh, tomorrow. Then we have one more thing to do, which is graphing sines, cosines, and tangents. And then we will have mastered Math 107. All right, make it a great day, everybody.